I'm learning Japanese. I think I'm learning Japanese. I really think so. Welcome to Sashimi Street. Today we have a special show celebrating Asian American and Pacific Islander Heritage Month and Memorial Day. Dr. Susumu Ito was a Nisei, second generation Japanese American, and a veteran of the Second World War. In 2010, he received the Congressional Gold Medal from President Obama. For his service and the services of Japanese Americans in World War II. There are about one and a half million people in the U.S. who consider themselves as Japanese Americans. They are the sixth largest Asian American group, but throughout the 20th century, they were among the three largest Asian American communities. Japanese first migrated to the U.S. at the start of the Meiji period with the end of the 250 year long closed door policy of the Tokugawa period. Meiji period. Black ships appear on the coast demanding the country to be opened. The forces outside and the conflicts inside drive the nation to move on to a new age. Swords are banned and the class system is abolished. Everyone becomes a commoner. People quickly pick up the Western trends. Many migrated from rural prefectures to the west coast of the U.S. and Hawaii. Most Japanese migrated from small towns and rural areas of Hiroshima, Yamaguchi, Kumamoto, and Fukuoka. The Japanese population in the U.S. grew from 150 in 1880 to 24,000 by 1900. However, In 1907, a gentleman's agreement between Japan and the U.S. ended immigration of Japanese laborers, but it permitted immigration of their spouses. This loophole in the agreement led to the practice of picture brides, where matchmakers would pair brides to oversee grooms using only their photographs. This led to tens of thousands of Japanese women. Entering the U.S. and Hawaii. Prior to the agreement, seven out of eight Japanese in the U.S. were men. However, by the 1920s, the ratio had shifted to four women to every six men. This allowed for there to be a second generation of Japanese Americans called Nisei. Before all immigration of Japanese ended in 1924 with the passing of the Immigration Act of 1924. Nisei spoke English fluently and were citizens of the United States. However, the prejudice during and after World War II led many Nisei to marry other Nisei, which resulted in a third distinct generation of Japanese Americans, the Sansei. Today's words and sentences: Ise, Nise, Sanse, Yonse. Today we are going to watch segments from an interview I did with Dr. Susumu Ito, a Nise, who was an auto mechanic, a war hero, and a cell biologist. The interview was filmed at his home in the summer of 2015. A few weeks before his 96th birthday. Well, I was born in California, near Stockton, California, uh, 1919, and uh, grew up on a farm. My <coughs> father was a sharecropper, and、uh, a very unsuccessful one. <laughs> We moved from. 
farm to farm. And uh, I think it was more or less barely existing because uh, uh, he, he didn't do very well. <clears throat> but I had a very happy childhood and and uh, 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 lived mostly amongst Japanese, Japanese and Japanese American, because there were many, many farmers. And uh, <clears throat> in fact, that's why they were allowed to come here because they could, they knew how to farm. And it was a very, uh, I was the oldest and only son of the family. I have two sisters, younger sisters, and went to uh, rural country schools, one-room schoolhouses with one teacher and uh, eight classes, eight grades, but uh, only uh, one teacher, one room, no electricity, no water, <laughs> running water, we had toilets outside, and uh, uh, of course nothing to do at night. We, we used to walk to school qu quite far. Uh, we did not learn very much because uh, I spoke Nihongo at home and, and had very, very few, almost no Caucasian friends. Uh, so uh, even my, my English when I started first grade was quite limited. In fact, I might tell you this, it might be interesting, I almost failed one class <laughs> when I was in the third grade because I went to several small schools and, and we moved close to a small town where the bus came and took us to, to classes. And this was a segregated school, only Asians in one school and Caucasians in another school. And it was very competitive. The, and mostly Japanese, Japanese American. And, and they were way ahead of me in their classwork. <laughs> and uh, my, my mother bribed them with silk stocking and chocolate candy. <laughs> and she did, did not speak much Japanese. And, she, and her English was very, very limited. But she could talk. And, and she even drove the car, would drive, uh, drive me to school and and uh, in any event, the teacher finally agreed. Okay, fine. We'll we'll let <laughs> let, let let me go to the next class. And after that, I did. Uh, I worked very hard, and I, I caught up with the other students. And uh, <clears throat> I went to about six of these schools, different schools, as I grew up to grammar school. And I went to, by the time I got high school, I was even with other students. So um, it, wasn't, it was not too difficult to, to, to keep up. Then uh, <clears throat> when I graduated, I went one year to a, a community college, junior college, but my parents thought, gee, there's not much future for Nisei to go to college because uh, there was really not much work unless you became a doctor, dentist, or work amongst the, the Japanese community. We were not officially segregated, but we were socially segregated into a town where most of the other people were Japanese or Filipinos or, or Chinese and uh, very few Caucasians. 
uh, I went one year to college, but uh, uh, my parents thought it would be more beneficial if I did something th that uh, I would have a job to do. And, and they knew that I very much enjoyed driving and uh, 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 repairing cars. So they said, why don't you go to auto mechanic school? I said, gee, I said, that sounds, <laughs> that sounds okay. I was admitted to UC Berkeley, but uh, 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 they, they still thought being an auto mechanic or working is something you like to do is better. So I went, and at the, during the training period, I worked in a in a Caucasian uh, a garage where they specialized in brakes and uh, uh, heavy frame uh, straightening. And they wanted to hire me. I said, "Gee, that sounds okay," and I was ready to. The school was only one year, so near the end of the year, <clears throat> uh, I was ready to go to work for them. And they said, I'm sorry, but we cannot hire you because the mechanics union will not allow Japanese people to join. So I said, sorry about that. I think it's one of the best things that ever happened to me <laughs> because uh, uh, for health reasons. In San Francisco, it's up and down, up and down the hill, and you wear your brakes out and clutch if you have them very, very fast. About 10,000 miles was average for a complete new set of brakes. And I got very good at changing the brakes. You could do four wheels alone in, inside of less than one hour. But in the process, you take the wheel off and you blow the brake dust until it's completely clouds and it's asbestos. So I, I, I still, I have probably some asbestos problems with my lung. Uh, so I couldn't work there. So in that respect, it was a, it was a, a good move, I think. I worked in Japanese uh, gasoline stations and garages, and, but it got very boring. It was, I was not happy. Uh, said, Am I going to do this all my life? But I had nothing else to do. And then I just in 1940, when I turned, just became 21, I got my draft number came. We had to sign up um, for the army because the war in Europe was escalating. And, and uh, uh, a number of us, uh, our numbers came up. They drew numbers out of the pot, and, and we were very happy about this because, uh, gee, this is going to be an interesting life. Uh, <clears throat> my mother used to tell me about how wonderful it is to serve in the army in Japan, and and uh, uh, it was a very honorable thing. Uh, uh, and and they made uh, 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 and they were, they were quite proud of me t for being drafted and and serving in the army. But one thing she did say: uh, don't get in volunteer for a dangerous job, just like any mother would say. Pop quiz. What did Dr. Ito's mother bribe the teacher with so that he would not fail third grade? Why was he not hired after mechanic school? 
And why was that one of the best things that happened to him? Proverb of the day. Rain falls, ground hardens. Similar proverb. Adversity builds character. Meiji, Taisho, and Showa, period. Japan joins the Western nations in a race for expansion. The Japanese succeed in defeating the Chinese. And then the Russians. The effort ends with Japan's defeat in World War II. In the second part of the interview, Dr. Ito describes his military experience before and during the war. So, when the war started, we were in a mixed unit, but they took all the uh, Japanese Americans out. Out of uh, 250, they were maybe 25 to 30 Japanese mixed with uh, Caucasians and, and uh, Latin Americans. Uh, and we were totally accepted, had good for good friends. We would go to, to town and all leave. And then Pearl Harbor came. Uh, uh, that was maybe not unexpected, but it was a surprise to all of us. Uh, they didn't know what to do with us. There was a. Uh, 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 war hysteria, and they thought that the uh, Japanese Americans would not be loyal to America, but would help the Japanese if they invaded the West Coast, that they would change sides. This was not true, but uh, there was a lot of propaganda against us. So, uh, they not only took us out of the army units and put all the Nisei into uh, camps, not in camps, we were still in the army, but we were not trained to fight. We, we had to do, uh, be away from the coast. And our, our work was uh, entirely uh, non-combat. We would su haul supplies, repair trucks, do uh, work, sec securing and guarding the place and maintaining it. <clears throat> and and uh, uh, <clears throat> this <clears throat> also was very boring. About the same time as we were moved, my parents, father and mother, from Hiroshima, I have two younger sisters, they were all rounded up <clears throat> with a <clears throat> total of about 120,000 men, women and children, and take only what they could carry. They could not own property, uh, so most of it was rented and temporary. They didn't, my parents did not have uh, a house even. We were just renting. So <clears throat> they were rounded up and sent to Arkansas. I was in Oklahoma doing non-combat work. I was a mechanic, so mostly fixing trucks and cars. And, uh, uh Again, this was boring. <laughs> I seemed to get bored with, with various 
uh, kinds of jobs. And, and uh, <clears throat> so, uh, uh, a chance came for me in the army. Let me go a little back, back forth. After about one year in uh, Oklahoma, Fort Sill, and with no combat training, they picked about 25 to 30 out of 200 Nisei to be part of a uh, combat team, the 442nd. In the meantime, my parents were in a rower re internment camp. And many people like to call it a concentration camp. But I, I really refuse to call them, although technically it's correct. The, because of, simply because you're Japanese, even if you're part Japanese, there weren't too many of those, they had to go to camp. And, and, uh, <clears throat> uh, uh, so there was, there was m many people thought it would be very difficult for us to be fighting for America while we, we were in a war with Japan. There were many times, including Pearl Harbor on December 7, 1941, that the military asked me to help interrogate to translate with Japanese uh, ministers, school teachers, community leaders. I constantly refused. I said, because first of all, I did not feel that this is what I wanted to do. Also, I, uh, my Japanese was very, is and was and still is very poor, <laughs> so so I was ashamed, constantly ashamed of this. And anyway, in any event, uh, uh, I uh, uh, refused to do that. Throughout the war, <clears throat> throughout the war, the military intelligence school was first in in uh, uh, early in San Francisco, then in was uh, uh, was. Um, uh, 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 Minnesota, but uh, uh, but I refused to go. I we had they did not force you to go. They wanted you to volunteer. So I was happy not to be in the military intelligence, but I was bored with the kind of work that I had. Uh, <coughs> Uh, as, as an auto mechanic. In the meantime, uh, I was in the army. I had a very safe job, but my mo my mother made for me a sending body. One of yeah, <laughs> like this. It has a tiger and uh, a thousand stitches. <laughs> I thought all Japanese know what a sending body. <laughs> But I guess not. My mother used to tell me about this because, uh, at least in, in her family or our family in Hiroshima, I got the general impression that it was very, very honorable to be in the military service. Just like teachers were very respected. Your sensei, if you teach kindergarten or university, and and uh, uh, <clears throat> but uh, uh, so I I uh, 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 my my parents respected this, but, but they wanted me to be in a safe position. My mother would write to me in katakana. I I, I can't read. <laughs> I can barely read the hiragana, but very few kanji. So I can understand a, in, enough that a little child speaks. Uh, uh, 
but uh, it's it's very limited. And and uh, as she told me that she was proud of me to be in the American Army, but uh, by all means not volunteer for any danger service and go to jail if necessary. And th this is what I think every concerned or loving parent would think of their children. And uh, I was not an exception. Uh, but I was bored. So when the chance came to volunteer for a more active combat position I, from an auto mechanic. I, had, I was a staff sergeant with the same rank. There was an instrument sergeant who became an observer, or sometimes they're called spotters, to find, see it. When you see enemy targets, you can direct you go up ahead with the infantry or to some place where you near the in the fr front line and direct artillery now it's one of the or it's probably the most dangerous job in the army but i, I thought i always thought that uh, i would never get killed i might get wounded but i, I had a complete positive frame of mind, and besides, my mother had given me a sending buddy, and also had, uh, here I'll show, oh, I also had a, a Bible that uh, my sister gave me, and, and, and as I mentioned earlier, a camera to take photographs. I carried these three items with me constantly, the sending buddy, uh, uh, I never, I told no one I had one. I did not know of anybody who had one. And I, I thought it was, and it, and it was a fairly unique uh, item. But from the time I was a little child, my mother would tell me about sending buddy and how honorable it is to uh, serve in the war, and uh, the Japanese soldiers uh, were not afraid to be to die f for the country, and uh, <laughs> th th that part I, I don't think had too much effect on me. But I, I was most curious about uh, experiencing what war was like. And, and uh, 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 to this day, I never regretted having experienced uh, a combat in Italy, France, and in Germany. And some of it was uh, very, very hazardous, uh, where mo most of our men were killed or wounded. Uh, I, and I feel, I don't know why I had such a positive attitude, I would come back and, and uh, I thought I might get wounded, but uh, I didn't even get wounded. And, and uh, I think I w I've been in a number of combat experiences. But the most memorable is rescuing the lost battalion in France. And, and uh, I, I was, by the time for work I had done in Italy, they gave me a, what's called a battlefield commission. I was a sergeant and they said, well, suddenly said one day that congratulations, Lieutenant Ito, so I became a second lieutenant. Uh, it was kind of interesting. Well, it was total surprise. I had no idea that uh, 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 they would promote some of us to become an officer. All our officers were 
almost all of them were Caucasians. Just like in the black units, most of the officers were white. And I was assigned to I Company, which was the lead of the three. And and my, my job was to uh, find the, find targets or be shown targets and and bring artillery fire on them. It was not a very good place for artillery because it was a heavy, heavy wooded forest. It was a managed forest where they grew pine trees for lumber. And, and so the tree, there were no houses, no no roads, just dirt trails, and and no no building, no fortifications. It was just pretty uh, pretty open forest area. Our unit, so we I did not have much chance to fire artillery because you couldn't see the targets. Uh, the one time that I did, I had to shoot just by sound where the shells were going, but without much success. Uh, we were uh, close enough to the Germans, so there were times when they would be shooting at us with machine gun, and we could hear one German say, hands up, hands up. But we look at each other and, and uh, of course we're not gonna surrender to a, a machine gun. Uh, uh, in the meantime, uh, actually even before this, uh, not only the she as an observer in an attack company you're with the company captain who controls everything in the in the company and uh, we started out with about a hundred and seventy men by the time we rescued the lost battalion uh, four to five days later there were eight riflemen left only only eight and uh, uh, maybe an equal number or so of uh, support personnel, the headquarters. The captain was killed about the second day. All the other Caucasian officers were wounded or killed. Uh, only sergeants were in charge. And, and, uh, there was uh, no doubt that uh, we, we were so because the number of people around you became lower, slower and lower. It be going back wounded or or killed, <clears throat> and and uh, for some reason I, I I never got even wounded. But I, I never thought I never thought I'd get killed anyway, because I kept thinking, "Golly, I'm gonna I'm gonna come back." Uh, it it just actually did not enter my mind that that I'm I'm not going going home. Uh, I never told my mother about this or other experiences I had, where I could have been relatively safe being a motor surgeon in the back the here I was on the front line with such high casualties <laughs> to make this part to end this part of the story when I came back just before Christmas in 1945 I, I entered in 41 February 41 and and this was 40. Five, uh, so that it would have been going on to five years. I was finally discharged in February, just five years from the time I entered. And and uh, 
My mother was so happy that <laughs> she couldn't hear. She, she didn't want to hear about my, my, my experience in the war. And, and just so happy that I was back. And of course, I was happy too. In the interview, Dr. Ito mentions his Senin body. It is a piece of white cloth with 1,000 red stitches, each made by a different woman. And it is given to a soldier going to war to protect him and to grant him a safe return. Dr. Ito gifted the item to the Japanese American Museum in Los Angeles. Today's haiku with basho. Choose which translation sounds the best. Natsukusa ya tsuamono domo ga yume no ato. Ah, summer grasses. All that remains of the warrior's dreams. Summer grasses, all that remains of soldiers' dreams. Here where a thousand captains swore grand conquest, tall grasses their monument. Pop quiz. How was Dr. Ito's experience in the military different before and after Pearl Harbor? What were the three items that he took with him to war? In the third part of the interview, Dr. Ito describes his career after the war as a cell biologist. My sisters, uh, or, or my cousin, they, <coughs> they, they got a, had a job in, in uh, Cleveland, and my Parents had no ofro to go back to in Stockton, so they went to Cleveland. So, uh, I after the war, I lived in there. I finished, and I was working in a garage, but again, that was very boring. So, uh, I fa I finished my undergraduate school, uh, and. Uh, uh, I, I, I like biology, so I think, and, and my professors would tell me, why don't you go into medicine or dentistry or engineering, perhaps? And I said, no, but I, I simply like biology. So I took all the biology courses I, did, I could. I had a very good friend, Katsuma Dan, who was uh, a, a professor. He was president of... Uh, uh, Tokyo Metropolitan University that started after World War II. And I got to know him at Woods Hole in Massachusetts. I used to, I was in Cleveland, but I, I would go to the Marine Lab and, and met scientists from all over Europe, South America, Japan, and all over the country. Uh, wonderful, wonderful atmosphere. The Marine Biological Laboratory. And this Katsuma Dan, Dan Sensei became very good friends. And and uh, we, we would stay up late into the night. In fact, I, I worked in his lab with him some. We were studying uh, how cells divide. Uh, one egg divides into two cells four cells, so forth, and, and the mechanism w with that. I got so interested that uh, uh, I, I, I did that work for quite a bit, uh, and always interested in individual cells and the mechanism of, uh, of, of how cellular processes take place. Graduated with my PhD. I got, I got a job in um, Columbia. I'm, I'm sorry. Uh, I was at at Cornell University Medical School. I'd never been to medical school, but uh, I was hired to go teach there. And and uh, uh, I was on my way to a postdoc in the Max Planck Institute in Germany. 
uh, uh, when I graduated. I did a short postdoc at Columbia University, and then this chance came to go to Germany. So I went there. I had no job to come back to. I had uh, interviews at the National Argonne National Laboratory, and and uh, they wanted me to come there in Chicago, outside of Chicago. But uh, it didn't quite appeal to me. But I, but I got a job at at Cornell Medical School, and I worked there uh, again on. S cellular cytology, uh, structure of the cells, structure and function. And at the time, this my my new boss said, we have nobody teaching the digestive tract, stomach, uh, intestine, mouth, salivary gland. So will you give lectures on that? So I said. Sh well, I, I don't know too much about it. I took a, you know, a course. Everybody knows a little bit about it. I had to keep one step ahead of the students from day to day, uh, learning about a new field. And it intrigued me that uh, 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 when you start talking about the stomach, you have because you try to relate function to the stomach, and then it secretes acid. Acid one over one million times more acid than neutral. So it has to come from some cell in the stomach. No one knew. You know, I go to the library and look at textbooks and reference books. To, to learn what I should tell the students. And it all comes out that said, well, it's not really known. There are five, uh, five, possibly six different cell types in the stomach. But they said, uh, there are three possible candidates, three different cells, that probably produces the acid, most likely. But nobody's ever been able to prove it. I became an expert on the structure of the stomach and and one cell which was different than anything else and almost different from any other cell in the body. So you <laughs> <coughs> my thought was that this is a, be the most likely candidate. And with a lot of work and collaboration with other people, I was, uh, I helped in determining that this particular cell secretes hydrochloric acid in the stomach. Then when my boss, after five years at Cornell, uh, it was terrible living there with three kids in the family in a small apartment, uh, uh, in in uh, in Queens, the the medical schools in Manhattan, and and uh, he said, "Would well, you want to move move to Boston with me?" I said, "Sure." I had known him pretty well after five years with him, so he said, "Don't you think you better ask your wife?" I I said, "No, I'm sure she'll agree, so I'll accept." And and I came back and told my wife and me, I'll, I'll show you some pictures of her. <laughs> and of course, she was very happy to to move. And we moved. That was 1959, January 1960. We moved here. We actually moved across the street. But by by July, we bought this house. 19. So that's 55 years. The house is 103 years old. Uh, it's the oldest house on the street. And uh, uh, I haven't been doing much to it because uh, the land is more valuable than the house. 
I do a lot of work. I, I, I built the deck completely. I put all the shingles in the house, the roof, the doors, the windows. And I, I, I painted it. I, I painted this house too. But I make things like this table, the kitchen table. I put the back door in. All, the, all for fun. So, so honors. He said, "Well, uh, I accept whatever, whatever small honors that, that happen to come by." And I, th I think the, the next thing I'm looking forward to is next month when they make an exhibition of my my photographs. Uh, uh, I think I think that'll be an interesting thing to do. And and uh, uh, yeah, I'm looking forward to that. Pop quiz. What does Dr. Ito study after the war? What does he become an expert on? Where does he settle down and raise his family? His friends called him Sus, but I believe his first name, Susumu, best describes who he was. Susumu in Japanese means move ahead, and that is what he did. In the interview, he often said that he got bored, but I think that was his nature to keep moving. There were many racial injustices and terror of war that he faced in his life, and yet he did not let it stop him. Dr. Ito passed away peacefully at his home in Wellesley a few months after this interview. <laughs>